Well, thank you so much for those kind words, David. Uh, I am delighted to be uh, with all of you here tonight on Wurundjeri land, and I would like to extend my respect and admiration uh, to elders and recognise their continuing connection to this country. Thank you to the Faculty of Business and Economics for the invitation to speak on this important occasion. Uh, this is a first for me. Um, I've given several lectures in honour of people that I greatly admire, uh, but this is the first time the person of said lecture is alive and indeed in the room. <laughs> Tonight's lecture not only honours the huge contribution of Professor John Freebain, it also marks his retirement from full-time academic life. And although I'm told John has been threatening to retire for a very long time, he assures me that this time he really means it. John, where are you, John? Up there. <laughs> I hope I can do some justice to your extraordinary legacy this evening. John has made a huge contribution to Australian economics and policy through his decades long career as Professor of Economics and the Ritchie Chair of Economics at the University of Melbourne, as well as through stints at Monash Uni, the Melbourne Institute and the Business Council. I have always regarded John as the policymaker's academic. He is one of those special people that has combined a thriving academic career with a deep hands-on engagement with Australian policy. Politicians and public service over the decades have drawn on John's wisdom. Many have described to me John's magic at combining academic rigor with clear communication and his talent for finding the cut through line. John's academic contributions read like a tax reform to-do list. In 2002, he published Opportunities to Reform State Taxes, which made cogent arguments for replacing stamp duties with broad-based land and payroll taxes. In 2005, he argued for closing loopholes and exemptions in the income tax base. In 2012, in the wake of the Henry Tax Review, he explored and expanded on options for more neutral taxation of savings incomes. Other publications have explored options for resource rent taxation and ways in which a higher or a broader GST could be used to reduce more distorting stamp duties and income taxes. Pick up the AFR on any given day and you will find op-eds making some variants of these arguments, grounded in the important work that John has done, unpicking the, effective, the, sorry, the efficiency and equity impacts of different options for reforming the tax base. John has also made the case for these reforms directly to government through his work on the Henry Tax Reviews we've just heard, as well as the review panel for the New South Wales Federal Financial Relations Review, among many others. And while John has done the hard work tilling the ground and has no doubt been pleased with some of the progress made, much of the broad agenda he has articulated remains on the shelf. So the question I want to ask tonight is why? Why, after so many decades of discussion, so many points of broad economic consensus, does tax reform remain so challenging? Is progress possible, or is tax reform simply an impossible dream? Part one, why reform taxes? To answer this question, we first need to understand why someone of John's calibre decided to use them making the case for tax reform. The bottom line is that tax matters. It matters to all of us. How much we collect, where we collect it, has implications for economic activity, government's capacity to deliver services and inequality. The challenge we face when we talk about tax reform is that different people start with very different objectives. So let's unpack some of these. The first is economic efficiency. Economists rightly focus on the fact that how we collect tax, that is what we tax and how much we tax, affects the economic drag created by the tax system. Almost all taxes come with some loss of welfare, but some drag on growth more than others. In a static sense, this can be measured by the marginal excess burden, how much economic activity is lost for every dollar collected. And as Treasury and others have reminded us, this can vary significantly between taxes. And while there can be diff big differences in the estimates different modelers come up with, which is a point I'm going to return to, there is a broad agreement that a tax mix switch from higher burden to lower burden taxes would deliver an economic dividend. The most clear cut example, and indeed one that John has spent a lot of time talking about, is moving from stamp duties to taxes on land. As you can see from the chart, stamp duties are among the most inefficient taxes. 
Treasury estimates suggest that every dollar collected may reduce economic activity by up to 72 cents. Stamp duties discourage people from moving houses to, to housing that better suits their needs and may discourage people from moving for better jobs. Overall, stamp duties distort choices and gum up the economy. In contrast, property taxes, which are levied on the value of property holdings, are highly efficient. If designed well and applied broadly, they do little to change people's incentives to work, live, to work, save and invest. Property taxes are also much more stable revenue source than stamp duties, and so make state budget management much easier. None of this, though, is to say that a decision to replace stamp duties with land taxes would be easy, either practically or politically. The transition issues are thorny, and the politics is notoriously challenging. Nonetheless, I am highlighting the land tax stamp duty swap an example of a case where there is rare unanimity on efficiency benefits. Indeed, it may be the only policy you could find the full spectrum of academic experts and think tanks in furious agreement. Another reason we might advocate for tax reform is budget sustainability and the need to future-proof our tax system. At a time when the Treasurer has delivered his first budget surplus in 15 years, and we are seeing what seem to be endless revenue upgrades, it may be strange to be having this conversation. But the fiscal challenge is a slow burn. Spending on the NDIS, on defence, on hospitals, on aged care, are all expected to grow strongly over the next decade. Government spending is expected to average 26.4% of GDP over this period, compared to less than 25% of GDP in the three decades before COVID. Revenues have not kept up. Structural budget deficits this decade are predicted to average 0.6% of GDP, or about 12 billion in today's dollars. These estimates systematically underestimate the scale of the challenge because of persistently optimistic assumptions around containing spending growth. The latest intergenerational report from the Commonwealth Government reminds us that the ageing population and the fallout from climate change will only see this fiscal challenge grow over the next 40 years. The same is true of state budgets. Currently, New South Wales is the only state to release its own intergenerational report. It too suggests the fiscal gap, the gap between revenue and expenditure, will widen over the coming decades. The implications of not taking policy action are clear. We are asking future generations to bear the cost of today's inaction. Ultimately, there are three levers that governments can pull to address these long-term budget challenges. They can make economic reforms to grow the pie, they can increase taxes and they can reduce spending. Pursuing policies to boost growth is critical. Much of Grattan Institute work has focused on policy change to grow the pie, and I look forward to pursuing this in a big way when I join the Productivity Commission in a couple of weeks. But as Grattan has highlighted in our report Back in the Black, released earlier this year, we cannot rely on higher growth alone to close the budget gap. Given the scale of the challenge, governments will also need to find ways to reduce spending and or boost revenue. After a decade of looking at this challenge, I have come to the view that we will need to do both. The scale of the challenge and the greater buy-in that can be achieved when the costs are spread across the population are arguments for looking to both sides of the budget for answers. But this is a personal view that reflects a value judgment, that deep cuts to services would be harmful to equity and our longer term capacity to thrive as a nation. Of course, others might have different value judgments and argue that taxes should not grow as a share of the economy. But given the structural forces of an aging population, a fallout from a changing climate, stronger spending on defence in response to shifting geopolitics, and the long-term trend for health expenditure to rise as better technologies become available, such a position can only be regarded as credible and intellectually honest if it comes with a complementary list of very sizeable cuts to spending programs. Certainly the usual election go-tos, cutting the public service, cracking down on welfare cheats, are largely illusory. They will, not yield this evening, they will not yield savings that are even in the ballpark of what is required, as I'm going to come back to. Now, if we accept that some additional revenue is needed to respond to the structural challenge outlined, then we want to make sure that additional revenues are collected with the lowest possible economic costs. On the other hand, if we do nothing, we may end up with the path of least resistance, collecting ever more revenue through creeping taxes on wage and salary earners. 
Bracket creep may be the most politically painless way to raise revenue, but it is far from the best. Tax reform for budget sustainability should aim to broaden the base of income taxes, looking at loopholes and overly generous concessions, as well as orientating our collection towards more efficient tax bases such as consumption, wealth, externalities or resource rents. In other words, we need to revisit the John Freeway and back catalogue. There are also other worthy reasons why particular reforms might be worthwhile. Simplicity is one. While often given lip service, anyone looking at the Australian tax system can only conclude that simplicity has not been weighted heavily in tax policy decisions over the years. The legislation just for income and fringe benefit tax runs to 8,108 pages over three acts. It is no wonder that almost two thirds of Australians use tax agents, a higher rate than almost all comparable countries. Policies that simplify the tax system for individuals such as standard deductions would reduce the need for tax reforms for the majority of Australians. This would also be an important reform. A fourth reason is fairness or equity. While the amount of redistribution to be achieved through the tax system is ultimately a values question, there are a range of ways in which our system is unambiguously falling short. One is the very different tax treatment for people in similar economic circumstances. High stamp duties mean that a household that moves a lot pays a lot more tax than an otherwise identical household that stays put. A person who puts their life savings in a bank account is taxed much more heavily on the resulting income than a person who makes additional contributions to superannuation or buys a more expensive home to live in. Second is the myriad ways that high, that well-advised high income earners can reduce their effective tax rates. Australia's complex system of carve-outs offers considerable leeway for individuals to massage their taxable income to avoid high marginal tax rates. An illustration of this is the distinctive bunching patterns that we see around round numbers of tax refunds, suggesting taxpayers and their agents are able to manipulate taxable income to some degree. Deductions and trust incomes are key mechanisms for this manipulation for those with access to these instruments. A third reason why a particular reform might be worthwhile is intergenerational inequality. As I and others have long argued, the degree of age segregation in the current tax system, where a retiree household on $100,000 pays half as much income tax as a younger household on the same income, is neither defensible nor sustainable. To be clear, all these rationales for tax reform, efficiency, sustainability, simplicity and fairness are valid. But many a tax reform roundtable has gone awry because people are talking past each other in terms of what they are trying to achieve. In reality, there are few reforms that will achieve all these objectives at once. But if we want to build a constituency for any reform or reform package, it is crystal, we need to be crystal clear about what we are trying to achieve and why. As a member of one of Australia's earliest tax reform committees declaimed in 1979, it is as if we are entangled in a boggy tropical jungle from which we can descry a whole set of habitable hilltops to which we might struggle over the years ahead, but they are all in different directions. To get moving at all, we need to first achieve some wide political consensus upon the ultimate destination. Part two, why is tax reform so hard? Given the many compelling rationales for tax reform I've touched on here, why is it that we have made so little progress over the years? There are many reasons that tax reform has proved a hard mountain to climb. Some are external. Well-resourced vested interests running interference, lack of expert consensus, the challenging media environment. Some relate to politics itself and the seeming irresistibility of a good scare campaign. And some obstacles to reform are deeply human. Some taxes just hurt more than others for a given dollar collected. And some of the changes most attractive to economists are not particularly attractive to real people. Let's address each of these in turn. Who's in the room muddying the waters on tax changes? As Niccolò Machiavelli wrote, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct or more uncertain in its success than to take lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has enemies, all those who have done well under the old conditions, and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. 
A key reason that we have failed to shift the door dial in tax is that the losers are often concentrated and vocal and the winners are diffuse and often disengaged. The challenge this creates is supercharged when combined with the aggressive tactics of some of the impacted groups and the relatively weak checks and balances on vested interest influence in Australian politics. The most evident manifestation of vested interest pushback on tax is the public campaign. Some of the biggest campaigns, public advertising campaigns mounted over the last 15 years by groups other than political parties have been tax related. The perceived success of the mining industry campaign against the resource super profit tax means threats of a mining tax style campaign have become standard operating procedure for well-resourced groups fighting policy battles. Promising a campaign is one way to be effective. Others have generated a very effective bang for buck through fear and misinformation. One of the most egregious examples was in the 2019 election campaign when certain real estate agents wrote to tenants claiming that rents will rise, not to mention the whole economy would be in jeopardy if Labor were to win the election and enact its proposal to wind back negative gearing and reduce the capital gains tax discount. The Real Estate Institute of Australia claim that this message reached 8 million Australians through its direct mail and Facebook campaigns. Another high return technique is commissioning dodgy economic modelling to muddy the public debate. Now, I have no problem with economic modelling. Indeed, some of my best friends are economic modellers. Modelling can be a useful tool for giving a sense of the broad direction and orders of magnitude of the economic effects of policy change. But it is only as good as its assumptions. Garbage in, garbage out, as the expression goes. My concern is that garbage out modelling receives as much, if not more, space in the public sphere than high quality modelling, because its eyebrow raising claims make for more alarming headlines. If I can return to negative gearing by way of example. In 2016, a consulting firm put out a report purporting to show the effects of removing negative gearing on the Australian economy. The results were spectacular. Changing negative gearing, a policy that was estimated to raise $2.1 billion a year in extra revenue in their model, would wipe 19 billion off GDP. Or to put it another way, every additional dollar of tax collected would wipe more than $9 off Australia's economic activity. Now, if you recall the chart that I put up at the start, showing the economic hit from certain taxes, you will recall that the economic harm from stamp duty to be estimated to be the most damaging tax was 72 cents in the dollar. Estimates of economic drag more than 10 times this large for any tax change simply do not pass the giggle test. The report should have been dead on arrival. But the laugh was ultimately on us. Not only did the modelling run uncontested on the front page of Australia's national newspaper, it received multi-page spreads in the major tabloids and was tweeted and referenced in Parliament by Australia's then Treasurer. That is a lot of bang for a buck for a report that probably cost less than $100,000 and was commissioned by an anonymous source. Even after the report was comprehensively discredited, its claims were sometimes emerged zombie-like in public debates years later. Not to mention the host of other reports of variable quality commissioned by those with similar interests in stoking community alarm. Another common tactic for those seeking to stymie reform is to seek to influence decision makers through lobbying and political donations. Lobbying itself is not a problem. Policy is a contact sport and we should expect businesses, individuals and others to advocate for their own interests in policy debates. Hearing from a wide variety of interests supports policy development and helps avoid unintended outcomes. But the challenge is that existing systems around political access and consultation mean that well-resourced interests often have much greater access and influence than other groups. Grattan's 2018 report, Who's in the Room, found that industries with the most to gain or lose from government decisions received many more meetings with federal government ministers and other groups. These industries, including mining, property development and gambling, were also much more generous donors relative to their contribution to the economy than other sectors. And money can buy access too. Whether it literally buys a seat at the table with a political leader at a fundraising dinner, or opens doors thanks to the sense of reciprocity that a large donation can create. 
Our work showed that in Queensland and New South Wales, where ministerial diaries are published, to their credit, major donors had a pretty good strike rate at getting precious meetings with senior ministers. Interest groups also sometimes use donations in, in ways that make it appear that they have an explicit expectation of a particular policy outcome in return for their money. The salary packaging industry, to take one example, is a classic case of an industry that thrives or flounders by the stroke of a government pen. In 2013, the Labor government announced plans to end the favoured tax treatment of company cars, leading to sleepless nights for industry players. Lucky for them, the then coalition announced it would reintroduce the tax breaks if it won the 2013 election. A month later, the Salary Packaging Industry Association donated 250,000 to the Liberal Party and almost nothing to Labor. Flash forward to the lead up to the 2016 election. Labor complied with the industry's request for a letter explicitly stating it would not roll back these tax breaks if re-elected. Both parties declared $165,000 in donations and other receipts from the industry associations, including a $120,000 donation to the ALP made just eight days after Bill Shorten provided the policy guarantee. Despite being some of the least justifiable in our tax system, these tax breaks are still with us today. And indeed, they have been supercharged in the name of speeding up the transition to electric vehicles, a policy the Productivity Commission has shown costs many times more than other policy options for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, the challenge of disproportionate vested interests aren't confined to tax policies, but they can certainly exacerbate some of the other challenges I want to come to. Models at 50 paces, the challenge of lack of expert consensus. Debates are more vulnerable to being co-opted by vested interest, where there is little counterbalance from other forces. This is particularly true when there is a lack of consensus amongst experts. In a 2021 report explaining why policy change in Australia has become so difficult, Grattan's former CEO, John Daly, concluded that vested interests were much better able to stymie reform if the evidence base was weak. It is simply, simply much harder for politicians to make the case for change if there is strong disagreement amongst experts about whether change is a good idea. This was evident in the 2016 policy debate about whether to reduce company tax rates. The Turnbull government proposed cutting the company tax rate from 30% to 25% in a bid to stimulate business investment and boost economic activity. But the main groups modelling cha the change did not even agree about the direction of the impact on national income, let alone the magnitude. Indeed, sometimes scratching the surface of the tax literature can leave one feeling slightly discombobulating. Populated, sorry. A synthesis of 45 studies on the impact of a host country's tax on foreign direct, foreign direct investments suggests a median estimated impact of a one percentage point cut in the, in the company tax rate is a 2.3% increase in foreign direct investment. However, the range is eye-watering, including a small number that suggests really large impacts and a not insignificant number that suggests no change or even a decline. Given the importance of expert input into tax debate, more empirical research into some of these questions would be highly valuable. To date, we have relied a lot on theory to understand the impacts of different taxes. We would also benefit from some sort of synthesis of expert modelling in major tax debates to at least provide clarity on the points of agreement and major sources of difference in models. Experts at 50 paces serves no one well, least of all people that believe the status quo needs to change. I smell a beat up, the role of media sensationalism. The longer I have worked in tax policy, the more I have been confounded by the role of media in tax reform discussions. On the one hand, some segments of the media regularly hand ring about the importance of tax reform for economic prosperity. On the pages of the AFR, for example, tax and IR, IR reform are shorthand for having a serious economic agenda. On the other hand, across the media, the excitement of a tax beat up appears an almost irresistible temptation. Indeed, the media feeds and feeds on scare campaign reflex of the political class, where even a mention of tax, ch tax changes by a political opponent is almost instantly weaponized. Media outlets give a disproportionate share of airtime to tax changes compared to other government decisions. Let's take this year's budget super tax changes as an example. 
This modest change to wires back tax breaks for only 80,000 of the most well off, with more than 3 million in super, was labelled a class war, a death tax by stealth, and a super, super size broken promise. It received front page coverage on the major tabloids, wall to wall coverage in our two national papers, and generated 1,200 media mentions in the month after it was announced. In contrast, the government's policy to expand government paid parental leave to 26 weeks and encourage more dads to take leave, benefiting around 180,000 families each year, received less than a quarter of the coverage in the four weeks after it was announced. This was essentially a rerun of the supersized backlash faced by the coalition in 2016, which also followed proposals it put forward to wind back the most generous super tax concessions for high balance accounts. Commentators quickly decried the super debacle, claimed that the debate was infested with the politics of envy, and warned Scott Morrison that this could be the rock on which you perish. The relevant minister even had her pre-selection threatened. Again, by way of contrast, a big new jobs, youth jobs initiative in the same budget received about a quarter of the media attention over the same period. There are many more examples I could share. The big reason tax stories are irresistible is they are easy to write. Tax changes neatly lend themselves to winners and losers framing. And it is losers that make for good headlines. The media is particularly adept at focusing on the sympathetic losers, regardless of how few of them there are or how small the negatives might be in terms of the overall impact of the policy. So for example, in the negative gearing debate, it was teachers and nurses who were trotted out as the real losers from potential tax changes. I'm gonna give a particular shout out here to the AFR, which managed to track down a married couple, both nurses with two children and four negatively geared properties. I really hope that reporter got a raise. As we showed in 2016, there are of course nurses and teachers that are using losses on their investment properties to reduce their taxable incomes. At that time, about 12% of teachers and 9% of nurses respectively. But they were much less likely to use the investment tax breaks than anaesthetists, 29%, surgeons, 27%, and finance managers, 23%. And the average surgeon reduced their tax bill 17 times as much as the average nurse. The challenge with this relentless focus on the losers is the underlying rationale for change gets drowned out. The losers from the status quo are invisible. We don't hear the stories of the businesses not started or the empty nesters who would have happily downsized but for the whopping stamp duty bill. This is particularly true because the biggest winners for tax reform are harder to put on the front page of a newspaper, except maybe as a cute photo op for politicians. Future generations would no doubt be pleased with a bigger economy and a healthier budget position. They are unfortunately poor advocates for reform. Heavily skewed and sometimes downright sensationalist traditional media coverage no doubt has some chilling effect on the willingness of our leaders to tackle these thorny issues. And that is before we have even got to the role of social media where scare campaigns on tax policy can flourish even where those policies are entirely imaginary. In the 2019 election, the so-called death tax scare campaign saw many widely shared Facebook posts, some by politicians, falsely claiming that Labor was planning to introduce an inheritance tax. The campaign was kicked off in the traditional media with the Daily Telegraph and Channel 7 reporting that the ACTU supported an inheritance tax and conflating it with the ALP's policy agenda. Minor parties, including One Nation and Clive Palmer's United Australia Party, picked up the story on social media where it was widely shared. There may be some justifiable reciprocity here, given Labor's own misleading scare campaign in the 2016 on the coalition's alleged plans to privatise Medicare. But 2019 was evidence of the way that fear and falsehoods can be effectively weaponised via social media, a phenomenon that has become only more clearer in subsequent years. In sum, social media and shouty traditional media increase the costs for leaders thinking of dipping a toe into the water on tax reform. Public opposition gets much louder, much faster today and reaches a higher vitriol point than it did in the past. Tax reform is not for the faint of heart. Almost too easy, the politics of the scare campaign. While the external environment undoubtedly creates its challenges, None of this is to let politicians themselves off the hook. 
If sensationalism about tax is irresistible for the media, for the political class, it appears an almost Pavlovian reflex. The scare campaign rumblings begin at even the faintest suggestion of tax change. When Scott Morrison publicly flirted with a GST rise as Turnbull's treasurers, senior Labor and union figures were talking up the prospects of a major campaign within days. Tony Abbott's campaign against the carbon tax is perhaps the textbook modern scare campaign. Threats of $100 lamb roast and the alarming prospect of the South Australian city of Wyala being wiped off the map. It was certainly both scary and headline grabbing. In a way, opposition to tax changes are nothing new. Tax reform has rarely been a bipartisan endeavour. Most major tax changes over the past 50 years, from capital gains tax to the GST, were contested by oppositions. In some cases, opposition was egregiously opportunistic, like Keating's attacks on John Hewson's GST proposal in 1993, despite it being very similar to the policy Keating himself had fought for just a few years earlier. But what has changed is the way that politics is played. In the post-truth era, the willingness of at least some politicians to embrace flagrant falsehoods and to use modern media to distribute them far and wide has most likely increased the potency of scare campaign tactics and therefore the cost to the would-be tax reformer. What about me, the psychology of tax reform? Of course, it's easy to blame the vested interests, the experts, the media, or our venal politicians for the difficulty in achieving change. But we ignore human psychology in crafting and selling reform at our peril. Louis XIV's finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, had this right more than 350 years ago when he declared, the art of taxation consists in so plucking the goose as to obtain the largest possible amount of feathers with the smallest amount of hissing. The hard fact is, some taxes are just more salient than others and therefore are always going to generate more hissing. Indeed, this is the fundamental difficulty of the land tax stamp duty swap. While it would improve efficiency and make many people better off, particularly those who move home more than average, it is a very hard sell. The reasons are intuitive to any psychologist. Paying even a big whack of stamp duty, say 50,000, doesn't seem that bad when you're purchasing something worth a million. It just makes an already huge mortgage a little huger. On the other hand, an annual bill of 5,000 is unavoidably salient. We are conscious of every dollar as we make the payment. The ACT government was acutely aware of this challenge when it designed the transition path of its stamp duty land tax reform. It landed on a gradual 20 year path to keep the geese a little calmer, which we are now halfway through. Tax reform is not for the impatient. Anyone who is trying to advance some of the less popular tax changes needs to grapple with these types of design choices. We cannot simply pretend that unpopularity is irrelevant. In many cases, this will necessarily mean some down payment to smooth the transition. Other human instincts can also prove challenging. People will deflect from debates about specific tax changes with the argument that we can't do anything until governments have fixed multinational tax avoidance, crack down on welfare cheats, insert easy solution to government's budget woes here. These easy outs can prove an almost impossible barrier to sensible discussion, since most of the things on the standard wish list are going to do little to shift the dial on the budget or the economy. As then Treasurer Scott Morrison explained in 2016, there are a lot of fairy tales out there at the moment. It is a fantasy to say that all we need to do some, is to do something on multinational tax and somehow then you can cut personal income tax rates. Indeed, most of the easy outs have already been extensively mined by governments given their relative popularity. Almost every budget of the past decade has contained at least some measures related to multinational tax avoidance, public sector budget cuts, reductions in foreign aid, increases to the tobacco excise, and or new welfare integrity measures. These are not where the big future dividends are going to lie. The only solution I see to this is being really explicit in tax discussions about what is big and what is small. Tools like the Parliamentary Budgets Office Build Your Own Budget Tool are powerful because they help people get a sense of the magnitude of particular changes and grapple directly with trade-offs. A related challenge is helping people understand the income and wealth distributions. Again, some high-level understanding of what most Australians earn is important for understanding how significant particular tax proposals might be, as well as their equity consequences. Indeed, preferences for different policy interventions change when people have a better understanding of the actual distribution of income and wealth. 
but the vast majority of us consider ourselves to be middle income earners, probably because the people we tend to live near and associate with are more likely to be in a similar tax bracket to us. This is presumably why every year or so, high income earners from the media and political class kick off passionate debates about whether 200,000 is really a high income. While I suspect the 97% of Australians earning less than that amount just roll their eyes. Grounding debates in the facts matters. That is why Grattan puts out an annual cheat sheet, how much do Australians earn and how much do Australians own to coincide with the budget. So the upshot of everything I have said is tax reform is hard. But does this mean we should just throw in the towel? Is it time for John to accept that his long career pushing for a better tax system has been simply tilting at windmills? The answer is clearly no. It must be no. Tax reform is simply too big an economic prize to be left on the shelf. So how can we chart a way forward through these challenging waters? Part three, what can history teach us? It can be easy to reflect on recent tax reform atrophy and pine for some long ago golden era of reform. But the truth is tax reform has never been easy. So I wanna round out this discussion with a short history lesson, five decades of tax reform in five minutes and what we can learn from it. Let's start in 1975. Many elements of our tax system today can be traced back to the 1975 Asprey Review. This was a comprehensive independent review commissioned by the McMahon government to address concerns about bracket creep and tax evasion. Sounds familiar. The review outlined the basic principles of efficiency, fairness and simplicity that remain our reform lodestars. And it made the case for many aspects of the system we have today, including fringe benefits tax, capital gains tax and a broad based consumption tax. But the report initially had little impact. Landing in the final tumultuous year of the Whitlam government, it was written off in the media as a tax flop and its main recommendations were not actioned. It took another decade for momentum to build. In 1985, fresh off the prices and income accord and the floating of the dollar, Hawke and Keating turned their attention to tax reform. They released a draft white paper on reform options and hosted a national tax summit with unions, business and community groups. This process resulted in the implementation of some of the major ASPRI recommendations, including a capital gains tax, negative gearing reform, fringe benefits tax, dividend imputation, and taxation on foreign source income. But it was a case of two steps forward, one step back. Broad-based consumption tax was central to Keating's original vision, but failed to win support and was dropped. Negative gearing reforms were repealed two years later. So the ASPRI blueprint was partly implemented. Another long reform slumber followed. The next big push would push was John Howe, just John Hewson, sorry, fight back platform for the 1993 election, which proposed, among other things, a broad based consumption tax. Fight back proved another false start. Hewson lost the unlosable election, but consumption taxes were back on the agenda. It took another six years for the reform dream to become a reality. Howard took a proposal for a new tax system, which included the GST, income tax cuts, and the ab abolition of a host of inefficient state taxes to the 1998 election. He narrowly won and the legislation ultimately passed in 1999, 24 years after the release of the Asprey report. We've seen precious little in the way of significant lasting tax reform since. The landmark Henry Review is close to celebrating its 14th birthday. Most of its meaty recommendations have remained untouched. State and, tax state and territory tax reform has also mostly been a non-starter, despite a succession of reviews converging on similar recommendations. So what should we take from this potted reform history? What can we learn about those rare moments when we manage to overcome the many barriers I outlined before? I see four key steps for would-be tax reformers. Step one, putting reform on the agenda. Our history shows that an external push is often needed to put tax reform on the agenda. This can take the form of a crisis. In 1985, fears about Australia's economic decline and resentment about tax avoidance pushed the discussion forward. In 1997, the High Court's decision to strike down a key state tax left a significant hole in the state's budgets and opened the reform window for the GST. The optimists in me can't help but draw parallels with the High Court's decision earlier this month to strike down Victoria's electric vehicle levy. 
perhaps we might have another golden opportunity for a grand intergovernmental tax reform bargain on our hands. We've also learned that consistent advocacy from outside politics can help put tax reform on the agenda. Tax reform was hardly on the radar for the Howard government until civil society groups, representing both social services and business, started championing the cause. ACOS and ACI, in particular, pushed in a coordinated way, culminating in the National Tax Reform Summit of 1996. The strong and united messaging put the GST and tax reform firmly back on the political agenda. Today, there are many groups that feel similarly. Federal independent Allegra Spender has been spearheading a push to unite academic, business and civil society leaders to build some consensus on the need for tax reform and the way forward. Step two, build a coherent package. While rewriting thousands of pages of the tax code at once would be a, <laughs> would be a recipe for chaos, relying on incremental changes is probably not going to get the job done. History shows that reform packages can work well. In 1985, reforms that broadened the income tax base were bundled with income rate cuts and tax avoidance measures, a coherent story to tell to the public. And in 1999, the removal of narrow and inefficient but lucrative state taxes and widely variable wholesale sales taxes made sense in the context of the broader GST deal shoring up state budgets. Packages provide the opportunity to dull the sting of reform by sharing the cost more broadly and offering some compensation to the losers. Indeed, the major tax reforms of the past two decades have come at an upfront cost. The GST package overcompensated households by about $12 billion a year through personal income tax changes and increases to pensions and family payments. This was a key part of the sales pitch. Former Treasury Secretary Ken Henry recalled that the distributional tables outlining the impact of the GST were the most thumbed part of the documentation, certainly by those Treasury officers answering phone queries. And of course, it helped a lot that those individual and family members represented across all income levels appeared better off. Compensation packages are particularly important when changes squeeze lower income households. Australians tend to reject reforms that are perceived as unfair. But crucially, potentially regressive reforms, such as broadening the base of the GST, can form part of a larger, fairer reform package. For example, the carbon tax package involves substantial assistance to address concerns that poorer households would be particularly affected by higher energy and food prices. Given the long-term budget challenges, high cost packages of the type needed to ensure that there are no losers from tax changes are going to be difficult to justify. But it's certainly possible to design packages with much lower upfront costs that still compensate vulnerable households. For example, Grattan's previous work, on, previous work on the GST proposed a revenue positive package with a 15% GST, cuts to income taxes and an increase in welfare payments that would have left the lowest 40% of income earners better off on average. Packages might also help address some of the other political economy challenges of reform. Ironically, opening up more fronts in the tax debate may quiet some of the more over the top reactions. As Ken Henry has argued, if you give a lot of well-armed people only one target to shoot, it will take a pounding. Incrementalism sets up a single target on a battlefield occupied by well-resourced attack forces. And while my goal tonight is not to opine on the what of tax reform, let me give you a sense of some of the types of packages that a government could put forward. On income tax reform, we could follow the logic of 1985 broadening the income tax base by winding back loopholes and overly generous concessions to support a cut in rates. This could include targeting discretionary trusts, super tax concessions, or reforming the capital gains tax, either by reducing the CGT discount or returning to the indexation of gains. Another package would be to tackle the inconsistent tax treatment of different savings vehicles, to reduce distortion in savers' choices and simplify the system. This would mean lower taxes on interest from bank accounts and bonds, but somewhat higher taxes on other savings vehicles such as superannuation. An even bigger bang version of this package would be a dual income tax, where income from savings is taxed at a consistent low rate regardless of source. On the corporate tax front, we could better tax resort rents to fund a company tax cut. We could also consider more wholesale reforms such as an allowance of corporate equity or a cash flow tax. 
For states, inefficient stamp duties could be swapped for land taxes over, over time along the lines of the ACT government's gradual phase in or Victoria's switch for commercial and industrial property. In transport, road user charges that vary by location and time of day would be a more efficient replacement for declining fuel tax base. And finally, to aid the climate transition, the government could substantially expand and strengthen the safeguard mechanism while eliminating much higher cost interventions to reduce emissions, such as the fringe benefit tax exemption for electric vehicles. This package would deliver both faster and lower cost emissions reduction. But while packages make a lot of sense, would-be tax reformers cannot be too purist. Incremental changes in the right direction are still an improvement on the status quo, and in some cases these more incremental steps can ultimately take us towards more comprehensive change. Step three, embrace the vomit principle. The next step is to make a compelling case for change. Complicated reforms that can't be explained are unlikely to win support and are more vulnerable to scare campaign. We saw this in 2019 with the confusion about franking credits, irredeemably branded a retirement tax. And in 1993, when John Hewson's tortured explanation of the effect of a GST on the price of a birthday cake helped turn the tide of popular opinion against the tax. Convincing the public of both the necessity of change and the proposed solution takes time and political capital. Howard and Costello spent two years and a lot of political energy highlighting the structural problems with Australia's tax base prior to releasing their tax reform package in 1998. And despite some of the challenges I outlined earlier, there is nothing to say the same is not possible today. It is a very long held view that the public will not tolerate more taxation. In the 18th century, Edmund Burke remarked, to tax and to please, no more than to love and be wise, is not given to men. Australian attitudes to tax are complicated. While no one likes to pay extra tax for the fun of it, many are more inclined when given a more concrete choice between better services and more tax. The proportion of Australians favouring less tax has declined since the late 1980s, according to the Australian election study and the proportion preferring more spending on social services has risen. At the time of the 2022 election, 39% indicated they would prefer less tax, 31% more social spending, and the remainder said it depends, presumably on the nature of both the tax and spending changes. My reading is when our political leaders do the work of tilling the ground and explaining changes and why they are needed, hearts and minds can shift. An example, albeit one contrary to receive wisdom, was the then Labor opposition's 2016 policy to wind back negative gearing and reduce the capital gains tax discount. We have already discussed some of the public challenges that reform faced, but what is worth remembering was that negative gearing had formerly been viewed as a political untouchable. Indeed, since the Hawke government lost its nerve and reversed its decision to wind back negative gearing in 1987, it had been labelled the sacred cow of Australian politics. When Labor announced it would introduce these changes to improve housing affordability and contribute to the budget bottom line in 2016, just over a third of Australians supported removing or limited negative gearing. But over time, as the opposition Treasury spokesperson Chris Bowen and others made the case, support gradually increased. Supports for limits on negative gearing climbed almost 10 percentage points from 34% in March 2016 to 43% in December 2018. By the time of the 2019 election, the Australian election study estimated that 57% of Australians supported limiting negative gearing. To me, this is a textbook example of what some political strategists call the vomit principle. You repeat something and feel, you feel like you're going to vomit, then you say it again, and only then are you starting to cut through. <coughs> Labor has of course since dropped the policy and many reading the media commentary would have gained the impression that the tax reform agenda was deeply unpopular and to blame for Labor's surprise election lost in 2019. The reality was far more complex. In any case, it is not just down to politicians to argue for reform. Successful tax reforms need a diverse cheer squad. Historically, academics, premiers, public policy institutions and community groups have all been important advocates for tax reform. Providing incentives for academics and not-for-profit organisations to participate in public debate would be a useful step in building these coalitions today. Step four, make it stick. 
Somewhat dispiritingly, even after these hurdles have been overcome, tax reform has been passed, the job isn't done. Tax issues tend to linger on the agenda, often for entire parliamentary terms, and sometimes reforms do not stick. As we've just seen, negative gearing reforms were undone after just two years in 1987. The carbon and mining taxes were repealed. The Perrottet government's hesitant steps towards stamp duty reform were wound back by the new New South Wales government. But in other cases, the controversy does die down after reform is enacted. Sometimes social norms can change quickly. For example, in Stockholm, congestion charging was much more popular after it had been implemented than before, and many people didn't even remember that they had ever opposed the idea. In Australia, plenty of tax changes that were controversial at the time, the GST, fringe benefits tax, capital gains tax, are now so entrenched that there is no constituency or any visible public appetite for their removal. Reforms are more likely to stick if they create positive feedback loops. For example, if they result in institutional shifts, make advocates out of reform winners, or if businesses make big investments under the new regime. Take the GST for example. The ATO and businesses made significant investments in the infrastructure of administering the new scheme, and the changes in federal financial relations created a key constituency, the state governments, who had a strong interest in its continu continuity. Conclusion. Tax reform, down but not out. This evening, we are not only celebrating Professor John Freebane's body of work, but also his move to the role of Emeritus Professor and hopefully a little bit more relaxed pace, including regularly feeding his horses. So as John moves to this next phase, what is the hope for tax reform? I, for one, remain optimistic. First and foremost, I don't think we have much choice. A slow burning platform is still on fire and over the coming decade the gap between our spending needs and our tax system's capacity to meet them without ever higher taxes on employment income will be stretched to breaking point. More and more questions of sustainability and intergenerational fairness are raised about our current tax mix. Expect them to get louder and louder over the coming decade without action. Similarly, tax must come into the conversation if we are going to deliver our policy objectives in other areas including the green transition. Second, I am confident that our leaders could make a positive case. While I have focused on the challenges tonight, I am also heartened by the leadership we are seeing on difficult reforms in other areas. Over the past three months, both the Commonwealth and state governments have made strong commitments to boost the supply of housing through politically challenging reforms to planning laws. If they can pull it off, it will be a huge social and economic reform and one that has been in the too hard basket for many decades. As a reform proposition, making the case for greater housing density is probably the same order of difficulty as making the case for major tax changes. And yet we are seeing both levels of government go after it in a big way. Third, I think there is appetite amongst a broad swathe of interested parties to shift the dial. Allegra Spender's tax reform roundtables suggest at least a consensus amongst business, academia and civil society that something needs to change, even if yet there is not broad agreement on the reform priorities. A process to harness this agreement, ideally led and shaped by government, could help move the conversation forward. Finally, I have confidence in the Australian people to see through the noise. Scare campaigns and shouty media are one thing, but if state and federal governments can hold their nerve in the rule in, roll out game long enough to make a positive case for change, and keep making it, history shows that people can be brought along. Tax reform is hard, but it is not impossible. It is time we woke up from our slumber and became a little less afraid and a little more free bane. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>